Hey, everybody. Welcome to the GMI Rocket Show. I am your host, Roman Zelichenko, and I'm really, really excited to be here with you guys today uh, for this uh, next episode of GMI Rocket Show. Today is episode number 89, and our guest today is Atal Agarwal, who is a recent, pretty recent founder. I'm really excited to have a, a really kind of a, a startup at the earlier stages of its life on our show. Um, Atal is the CEO and founder of Immigrant First, which is an AI-based um, immigration tech startup that is helping individuals put together app uh, immigration applications using generative AI and um, a really interesting workflow. Uh, um, Atal uh, you know, created this out of the frustration of his own um, situation, as we'll get to. He uh, was in the U.S. on various visas and then eventually on an H-1B um, and had a, 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 you know, dramatic experiences with the H-1B visa that I will not give away, uh, which led to him trying to understand how can this process be better? How can, you know, folks who are in the U.S. Um, studying and working, contributing to the to the country and to the economy, how can, you know, their immigration process be more smooth and and how can they be taken care of better? And so that led to Immigrant First. So I'm really excited. I'm Roman Zelchenko, your host. I'm a former immigration attorney and now uh, the CEO and co-founder of Laborless, which is an immigration tech company that automates H-1B visa compliance. Um, and also the founder of GMI Rocket, which is a digital marketing agency for the immigration and mobility industry. And of course, which brings you the show. Um, so without further ado, I'm really excited for this conversation. Atal, thank you so much for being here. And I'm super, super stoked for our, our discussion. Hey, thank you, Roman, for having me here. And I'm very excited to be kind of discussing this topic, which is very close to my heart with everyone here. And, uh, you know, this is my first time on a show like this. So definitely, I am learning myself in the process. And uh, very excited to be connecting with everyone who is in this field and uh, being able to contribute with value to be able to improve the immigration system of this country and around the world and improve the human mobility around the planet as we are together in this whole mess of life. So how can we do it together and in better where there is less suffering for human beings? So excited to be here and uh, looking forward to the conversation. I love it. Thank you. Um... For the folks who are watching here live, uh, who are with us on LinkedIn or YouTube or or Facebook, you know, give us, throw some comments in. Let us know if you have any questions. If you have any questions for Atal, if you have any questions for me, or if you just have any thoughts or comments as the conversation goes. Obviously, if you're liking this conversation, you know, you can give the post a like or a love or a heart or whatever, wherever whatever platform you're on. Uh, we are watching this. Um, so Atal, you know, I. I think a lot of folks in our industry have um, a personal connection to the immigration space, which sort of brings out this mentality of this can probably be done better. And then, you know, exploring how and then trying to come up with a way to, to do that. Um, you know, I came to the country when I was two. So, yes, I'm an immigrant and my family, we had went through the immigration process. I was I was very young. Right. It's very different when you come here when you're so young versus when you come here when you're older. I know that you came to the U.S. when you um, basically finished high school in, uh, and, and, and university as well in, uh, in India. So I want to go back to, you know, maybe just life for you before we get to the immigration process. You know, I love to learn about the guests and, you know, sort of their roots, where they come from, what they were like when they were younger. I feel like it always connects really nicely to what they're doing today. So can you share a little bit about kind of maybe where you grew up um, you know, a little bit about how you grew up. Did you have any business people in the family, any tech people in the family, something like that? Definitely. Okay. So, okay. I think when we think about where my journey started or I was born and brought up in this small town in India called as Rampur. It's in a state called as Uttar Pradesh. That's where I did my, most of my high school, like I studied there till sixth. Um, my, my dad is in service industry, so he's in accounts and uh, he has worked for a single company for like his 20 years of his life. And uh, it's a, kind of like a village town uh, where there is one or two schools where which are English medium where you can uh, learn science and math, but mostly not not like to where I am now about this whole country. And I mean, what I had as a vision or like a pain picture of America at that point is looking at this uh, 
golden gate bridge as a wallpaper of my computer maybe when i was learning logo in my in my sixth standard or just just going through that journey and seeing these beautiful bridges and looking at like oh wow this is also a part of the world we all share together and there is a country like america where this is is there and i never thought i'm going to end up here and so i'm like so privileged uh, to be here today but i feel like uh, it's like just uh, looking at the world from a very much of a place where my parents had a hard time sometimes paying for my own education um and uh, sometimes we were like okay my fees was always paid late to to school and uh, then i just continued in that in the journey and like my dad is like always about like hey we should get you more education and uh, my dad always focused on getting us more education and uh, then we moved to delhi and uh, that's where my dad is like hey you should prepare for iit which is like the hard one of the hardest examination in the india and i was definitely not a studious kid i was very much a backbencher and i would never be like the serious person but it's like you know when you see your parents doing so much for you and you are like okay i want to at least help fulfill their dreams more than my dream and because you do not know in high school what is your dream you are like okay who's this is like my dad's dream okay i should at least not bring them down you know so i started preparing for iit and uh, somehow i managed to get into iit and that was all about my dad's dream where he was like okay if you're going to get into iit then i would never have to worry about you in life and i was like mm-hmm. okay let's at least get this thing done in high school and i got lucky to be able to make it to iit kharagpur i was definitely not among the top people at iit either getting computer science at iit is like you got to be in the, in among the top 500 people in india and think about million people competing on the same exam it's harder than mit stanford you have so much of competition everyone in india wants to be a doctor or an engineer so you see all this everyone graduating from high school competing for the same exam iit that hey i want to get into this college uh, so i mean i just made it through but i was not among the first first 500 people who got computer science but then, then i started getting into college and i was like my college was very far away from my hometown and that's the first time i kind of left my family away from delhi and i went to the east part of india near kolkata which is like probably more more 2000 kilometers away uh took a train it's, it takes like 20 to 24 hours to get wow. by train and i was all by myself from delhi to that first time going to kharagpur and thinking like okay now i am all on my own and uh, how i'm going to live life after now at the same time there is this feeling of freedom because now i'm like okay now i have fulfilled everything that my dad ever wanted me to do now i can do whatever i want to do but i don't know what i want to do but i'm like okay i want to do something but now i will figure it out um at that point also i was very much i had this activism in me where i was like if things are wrong it is my responsibility to stand up for the right and i remember there were like protest going on in high school when even when i was preparing for iit for against corruption and against uh, against when there were rapes happening against women and i would just feel like so bad about not able to contribute and sometimes i would fast at my own house just to support the cause or i would show up at the parliament when there are protest happening and i would go and say that hey this is wrong and i want to m- make sure there are better laws passed on those domains so i feel like there was this activism in me starting with like 11th and 12th standard itself where i was like if i, I it's not about complaining i have to show up if i truly believe something has to change mm. and uh, as as much as i show up whenever i show up i actually contribute to creating that change and probably it comes from what gandhi has done for india about like being the change you want to see in the world and you can all do it through no non violence and being honest and being truthful and i feel like just reading all these great people who have lived on earth i was like i want to live a good life i want to like look up to these people so that activism was, was always there in me mm. and once i entered iit and when i was like okay now i have to figure out my own life what i want i started exploring a few things i got into software a little bit more and uh, learning about software working on self driving cars and vehicles while in campus so i learned a lot of things there and i was like okay wow i like i like coding um i might not become the best person in coding but i can enjoy that part and i enjoy working on these domains 
-hmm. Along with that, I also started getting more and more into public service. <clears throat> and I got into like more of a leadership roles within the campus. And uh, in my pre-final year, when I was like, okay, I want to contest the elections for the president of the student body. And a lot of people were like, no, you would never become uh, because it's just so hard. And I, I was like, first of all, you should never tell me what I can't do because that just motivates me and drives me towards doing it. And uh, that just started changing a lot of momentum around my life where I was like, no, I truly enjoy public service. I want to do more. And uh, I started uh, mobilizing my campus about like, hey, these are my initiatives. These are the things I want to do. And a lot of people started supporting me in that vision. And I ended up winning the elections of my college at IIT with the highest margin in the history of the college. Wow. And That's I was awesome. like, yeah, I was like, wow, so this works. If you keep believing in yourself and if you keep, keep going with the right intentions, things do change. And mm -hmm. you can come into that, uh, that low role of leadership in the world if you keep following the right path. And uh, yeah, I think uh, then th that one year is where I had to figure out whether I was driven by the power, whether I was driven by the fame mm -hmm. of it, or whether I really enjoyed doing public service. And I feel like uh, what has worked wonders for me, and I feel like I have this deep sense of that I truly enjoy public service. It does not come to me like, hey, I want to I wanna get more power in the world because I do mm -hmm. not care. If, if immigration gets solved, you will find me biking uh, outside on the mountains. I would not, not be in this topic if, if, it, if, if it, it would change. And it does not matter who brings the change to me as well. Um, so I feel like at that point, I started realizing that public service is something I truly care about. And uh, my life kind of took a very big turn during that year, when one of the one of the person from America, his name is Vinod Gupta, he has a, he came from India in 1960s and he took a company public and sold it for like a billion kind of dollars. In, in America, do you mean? Yes, yes, yes. He came yeah. from India to America to study yeah. at University of Nebraska. And then he continued building his business and sold a company, I think for seven, eighty million dollar. He's friends with like Bill Clinton and uh, he he's like with big in Omaha. So he he came on a visit because he has given like $100 million to my campus to open different schools in the college. And I just met him outside my hostel dorm room. And I said, thank you so much, sir, for everything you do for our college. It was just this small conversation for just a minute. And, uh, and I was the president and I was just like, sir, I'm going to show you the campus and we love everything that you have done. And I will take you to the show, show you different parts of the campus. And that was just the whole conversation. And then I got busy with taking care of the student body and everything. And two days later, he sent me an email that, hey, what great meeting you. What are you doing this summer? Come to US and uh, work with us. And at that moment, I was like, wow, I just never thought life is going to change so much. Think about this, this boy being in a village in India. My campus, Khadak, IIT Kharagpur campus is a very much village. It's it's. And I'm in that village and I have, I'm just like enjoying the beauty of everything that I have, my people supporting me, me being able to do great things. And I meet this another person who's like, okay, I want to show you the other side of the world and come and mm -hmm. work with us. And I was just mm -hmm. like, wow, I would not want to miss out on this opportunity. And I want to come and I want to like, uh, see this, uh, see America. So as soon as he said, he started helping me get my J1 visa and I came on a J1 visa that time down the line it ended up me coming to the us and a lot of people in his company americans liking me and me being in omaha going to church every sunday with all the people with my house so i had a housemate uh, his name is joe and his family started liking me a lot and we started going to church every sunday and i had a great time in america on my first visit and i'm like this mm. is a great country I let, 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 let me ask you. So, so you, yeah. so you were just so I get this. Um, you were studying software engineering uh, in in IIT. You were also the class president. Uh, so and, yes. Yeah. So I was not studying software engineering. My coursework was in mining engineering. But I oh, in the in the campus, I was learning all the software skills too right. because I could do whatever I wanted to do on the side. And uh, yes, so I was studying those things and I was learning software. And I was the college president of the whole campus. So we have like around 12,000 students here. 
And so you were you finishing university that year or that summer was you still had to go back to IIT after the summer? I had I had to go back. So my course was a okay. five year course, like four years plus one years. Yeah. Right. OK, so this was during the fourth year. This was actually in my third year. Oh, in your third year. Okay, so yeah, yeah. great. So I, I just I just want to understand because yes. you, you you did come back to India. So you you came yeah. through, you went through the J1 process. I'm just curious, how was that process for you? Was that taken care of by the company that was trying to bring you in? Or did you have to deal with the J1 process on your own at all? Uh, I did not have to deal with it. At that time, the company had the sponsor and they had a university right. as well. And right. they did all the processing for me at that time. Nice. That's yeah. great. So I okay, didn't so, so, have to do it. Yeah. So you come over to the U.S. Did you go to Omaha? Yes. Yes. Never Is that Omaha, really, yeah. Yes. And, and by the way, that's where uh, Berkshire Hathaway uh i believe around there is is, is 100%. Um, it's kind of funny i made a visit uh to to the office like i was like okay i want to check out this company um and yeah i had i i was always going around that area to just check out the company you know yeah. yeah yeah no it's 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 a it's a cool business area so yeah. you okay so you show up for it to omaha for mm -hmm. a summer as a j1 intern basically um so tell me about that summer i mean you're sharing that you you had a housemate you went to church you kind of really immersed yourself into american culture did you think to yourself at that time i want to come here you know after i'm done with iit or did you think okay this was a fun summer i learned something i can't wait to go back finish my studies and continue my life back home um i don't think i mean at that time because my college president year was about to start Mm. I was very excited to come back to India because right. I was like, okay, one year, I was like, definitely very much into coming back to India. At that time, it was like, yeah, this is a great summer. And I learned so much about US universities. And I can implement all these things back into my campus. That's awesome. Okay, right. Because you were also part of a university during yes. the summer. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so then you return to, to IIT and uh, you finished your, you know, your, your university studies. So tell me a little bit about what your th thinking was about your career. You know, you finished with a degree in engineering. You obviously took some software engineering courses mm -hmm. as well. Um, were you thinking I'm going to stay and work in India? Or are you thinking I'm going to try to go somewhere else in the world, maybe, you know, or something else? Yeah. So, you know, um, as a, as a kind of college president, I was also responsible for the placements of the whole student body. So we have like a whole process of getting jobs for people where companies come to visit IITs and, and everyone gets a job. And at that moment, I remember I was very clear that I don't want to do a job and I want to build my own company. And I did not apply to any company when I was graduating. I was like, I think in that time, all it was on my mind is as soon as, as I graduate, I moved to Bangalore. And then I'm going to start building my own business because I want to try things out. And if I fail, it's OK, but I want to try things out at that point. Um, it was I wasn't very clear on which idea to work on at that point. But at the same time, I was like doing a job in an area that I'm not interested in would not be the right thing for me to do. Mm -hmm. Did you have any ideas at the time? Um, I feel like I remember I was def very passionate about improving education. Hmm. Um, so education was something I really cared about how it can be improved. There were some ideas I was exploring related to education, how, uh, non-vocational training can be improved. Non-vocational coaching can be improved. Um, I did try those things in a couple of summer camps. So there was one summer camps organized by a group of MIT professors in Bangalore. So I, I worked there and we tried doing a startup idea there. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I tried another one, which was organized by another MIT professor in Kerala. That was also, I think in third or fourth year of my undergrad. So I did both those things to actually just continue exploring. And I was like, yeah, I, I love building new things. So I think startup is going to be the right thing. I'm curious, and I'm going to go back in time a little bit. Yes. Um, when you were younger, I like to ask this uh, of the guests, but when you were younger, did you, were you the kind of kid who, you know, sort of quote unquote started your own business. So maybe you sold 
cards or you fixed, you know, your friend's bikes for a couple of, you know, like, or whatever. Were you that kind of a, a kid at all? Or, or, or did this idea sort of grow as you grew as a student with you and you realized, you know, okay, well, maybe starting something is something I'm more passionate about? Um, well, as a kid, I was not that kind of kid for sure. Uh, I was a very me, shy kid. By yeah. the way, me neither. I'm, I'm the okay. same. I was the same. Okay. Yeah, I was a very shy kid and I was like, I would mostly keep things to myself. I was very introvert too. Now it has changed a lot in my life. But I feel like uh, I definitely had something where I want to do something of my own. Uh, which was very much there because my dad worked in the service industry his entire life. And uh, as much as I appreciate all the, you know, the way he got us all the education, I was like, we're still a part of that, that hustle. And I was like, okay, can I do something more of value? Can I provide employment for more people? Can I be more of the creator? And I think uh, my dad also, even though he worked in service, he was also very, though his mindset remains very much about like, hey, be on the safe side and uh, like, hey, have a job and that's the more secured space. But I feel like he also keeps pushing us, uh, me, my brother and my sister, like, hey, keep doing keep doing more than what you are told to do and try to do more uh, things. So I feel like there is that mindset also in our, mm. in our family. Mm. Not that uh, we have done it in a big way, but I feel like there is this mindset for sure. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I, it's, it was the same for me growing up. I think mm. nobody in my nobody in my family really had a business. Um, I never really had business ideas, but there was some discussion around, oh, you should st like almost joking at home. You should start yeah. a business. Oh, you made this really good sandwich. You should open up a sandwich shop. Oh, yeah. you, uh, you know, you, you, you knit a really nice hat. You should knit a thousand hats and go sell them. Like it never happened, but that yeah. idea, that sort of the, the notion was always there, which is interesting to reflect on because now I don't ever want to, you know, I, I, working for myself feels so natural yeah. um, and building something feels so natural, but growing up that yeah. wasn't the case so yeah you know, i was just th was those curious. words those words as a kid when you hear someone just like appreciate you that hey you might actually be good at it it mm. kind of like provides this kind of validation where mm. maybe yes it might be true because someone who knows me so closely is telling me that it is possible and by just knowing that there is a door like that and someone saying that that is possible just in words means so much and uh, right. can create so much wonders and magic yeah, I definitely agree, especially when you're yeah. younger, when you're still yeah. learning yourself and you're still understanding how do you fit into the world? Having somebody who's close to you say you did something so well that maybe other people would buy it from you. It does yeah. mean a lot. Um, yes. All right. So I was just curious. So I want to I, I want to fast forward again. So mm -hmm. you you finish your university studies. You're trying some of these sort of startup options, you know, maybe mm -hmm. thinking uh, diff different um different ideas and it sounds like in different cities you're in kerala you were uh in bangalore you said right as well um so how, how did you then enter end up entering sort of the software engineering world i mean you ended up getting a job so something yeah, yeah. you know how did that happen <laughs> uh yeah definitely so i think when i so when i was graduate when i was about to graduate and i was like okay i'm going to bangalore is when uh, my mentor vinod gupta he kind of said Hey, if you want to come do a master's from the US, I would be happy to cover some of your expenses. And uh, I was definitely not into taking a huge loan, but then I was like, if someone is covering some of the expenses, it is a better way to come to America rather than being in our debt for a long time. And uh, that's when I started exploring UC Santa Barbara has a course called as Masters in Management. And uh, I was like, I enjoy technology. So my course is called as Masters in Technology Management. So I enjoy technology and I enjoy management, like from all the different sides of roles that I've taken. So I found this course as like a perfect thing for me to come to America. I was like, if the course, irrespective of how the course is, Santa Barbara is a beautiful place um, and I would never regret <laughs> it in my life. Right. And uh, I was like, OK, la yeah, let's go close to the beach. And the worst that can happen is me hanging out on the beach for a year. So I was all like, right. let's do this. Uh, the course ended up good and uh, this thing about entrepreneurship which was there back in india too it continued showing up in campus in my uc santa barbara too they have a competition called as new venture competition and i was very passionate to participate in it and we got together a team 
and we ended up winning fifteen thousand dollars as the first prize in the competition. Wow! And I was, awesome. I was like, I was like, wow, this is, you know, this is just like genuine passion about. Uh, first of all, I care about things that provide me with some meaning too. So the idea we pitched there was about a uh, solar idea. It was in the solar area where I was like, okay, having more solar improves our overall world, and we move towards a better way of energy. So it was a solar idea and uh, we pitched that idea. It was a great uh, concept and we won money. We found angel investors who were like, hey, we want to invest in you too. So it, it, so we, we raised some money for that startup too. And wow. uh, it, it was a hardware idea. And hardware was not my sweet uh, domain at that time. And what we pitched is just more of a concept that, hey, it works as a business. So once i once we continued developing it and testing out our prototype we were like well our idea got invalidated we were like okay this hardware does not make sense and uh, i was very much about like using my time for the most effective things and i was like i'm not going to work on it if it does not make sense mm. if, if the idea does not make sense no if it's a research problem that's not my expertise research is r and d's r and d uh, and in that moment we ended up like dissolving our company, giving back the money to the investors. We gave back most of the money because I was like, time is more precious here and I, we should do something that we truly care about and where we can create the most value with our time. And that's when I ended up getting a job at Castlight Health, which is in healthcare as an associate product manager. Um, that was in software and uh, I had experience in software, but not like software product management. But the first job as an associate product manager, I kind of got a great training from my manager where how does it work to manage products in a software domain? Um, so I think that that is like one thing which uh, helped me a lot. And I got that job because of being from IIT and I did a lot of networking when I was at IIT in India. So I connected with so many people and uh, when I'm now here and I'm like looking up jobs and I would find someone, I would be like, hey, wanted to say that, hey, I'm from IIT. And uh, then people would like, okay, let's find, figure out interview. But it's so hard for international people to, people to find jobs in America because we leave all our network back in our countries and we are building from scratch here. I feel like so privileged that I went to IIT and we have some network here in the US that it's mm -hmm. easier to at least kind of like go to the next step. But yeah. I feel like it's so hard for so many people uh, around the world. Yeah, definitely. It's it's it is difficult to get in the door. Um, yeah. You know, honestly, like I studied my all my life here, my mm -hmm. high school, middle school, university, mm -hmm. and even still, because my family came here from another country, we didn't mm -hmm. we didn't have this. You know, a lot of people say, "Oh, let me talk to your uncle knows this person, or your aunt yeah. knows this person, or your parents went to school with somebody." And as you know, an immigrant is is you just you don't have that. You really do have to start from scratch as an international student, even more so because yeah. you didn't even go to school here. You didn't grow up here. It's, it's even more difficult. Um, so you got that job, you, you worked as a product manager. And by the way, for people who are listening, who may not know a product manager is kind of like the in between, between the, the client, whoever the end client is, and then the technology team. So the product manager tends to talk to the, the the end user, you know, so it's an internal yeah. client or maybe an external client, understand what that client wants. And then you have to go back and speak to the technology team and make sure that they build it the correct way. It's yeah. I think I, I did a little bit of that kind of work when I after mm -hmm. I stopped being an attorney and mm -hmm. before I launched my company. And mm -hmm. like you said, it was some of the most invaluable uh, training I could have received to start my own business because now yeah. you understand both sides. You understand the the client side and then you understand the technology side. So it's very cool that you that you had that experience. And I wonder how much of it you used when you eventually launched Immigrant First, you know, that that learning. Yeah. Um, so, all right. So you had that job. You um, continued your career. Mm -hmm. And at this point, you were probably on an F1 OPT working. Correct. And so yeah. did you have the, you had three years because you had a STEM, uh, considered a STEM degree, right? Yeah. Yeah. I had three years and I kind of got lucky. Most of the time, my h one got picked, uh, in the lottery. And, uh, nice. it was more about me doing through a council processing where I was like, okay, I, I want to go back to India and get it done there rather than moving immediately to H1B. And then I changed job and because of the job change also, 
I lost one of my H1B, but then I got picked again. So I, I'm I'm very fortunate. You know, when I when I talk about immigration, I consider myself as one of the most fortunate beings who is navigating the immigration system. At the same time, that's where my passion comes because I feel like there are so many people who are struggling so much more than me. And I just feel like this guilt in me where I'm like, why do I get what I'm getting? Like mm. I it feels like it feels like the game is a little bit unfair to other people. And where I was mm. like, okay, how can we make it more fair? Uh, mm. How can more people get justice uh, through the system? Yeah, I mean, right now, you know, and H one getting picked in the H one B lottery is getting more and more and more difficult every single yeah. year. So, yeah, yeah that's um, so. So you got picked for the H one B. It sounds like you moved around a little bit. So then, eventually, you did. You went through consular and you you got your H one B visa. Um, what was that? like for you did you feel like okay whew, like i've got the work visa i'm working a job that i feel like is you know yeah. um fulfilling me and teaching me and it's paying you a salary did you feel like this is it for me or were you always still thinking about ideas and, and things you can build and create on the side i feel like th so when my first startup failed i got a lot of contentment from that failure I just realized in that moment, I realized that yes, whatever I wanted to try, whatever I knew, I practiced. Now it's time to learn and get back to industry and learn and learn from other people. And so jobs, the time at those jobs was very contentful for me in learning things from other people. And I was like, yes, I'm in the right career, which is teaching me the things that I want to learn. And it's helping me progress too. And uh, down the line, I would start something of my own. Now, when I got to H1B, that's where I think started getting more and more complicated because now, yes, I have H1B, I have work visa, but then there are so many, so many challenges where what you can do in H1B and what you can't do in H1B. And it felt like I actually got stuck in this process. And I remember my next goal became in the company is like, hey, can I get my I-140? And uh, my company is like, yes, we will sponsor your I-140, but sponsoring an I-140 takes like a year or year or more. And that's where things started going bad, where my company is going in a, in a tech industry, layoffs are going on. And my company went through the first round of layoff. My application for I-140 is in the process. My company went through first round of layoff and I was saved. And I was like, wow, okay, I am okay. But at the same time, my I-140 was not processed. And I was like checking to my, with my attorney, like, hey, what is the status of my I-140? Did we make it through or not? My attorney said, it's going to take now six months more before we can apply for your I-140 because company went through layoff in an, and they laid off a role which is similar to your role because mm. of which your role cannot be said that uh, we can go for I-140. Mm. I'm like... That's just so bad because now I have to wait longer and tech layoffs are going on. And my company went through the next round of layoff. And at that point, I was impacted. And I think in that moment, I was like, well, I was just chasing the wrong battles all the time. I just felt like I was trying to, I was trying to not to, I was trying to like just feel like, okay, how can system support me while the whole system is designed? to bring me down and make me fall more and more over this period of time. And I'm just trying to like, as if I'm always on this pedal of running and running and running and getting out of the system while the system is not designed with keeping me in mind. Hmm. And uh, then I was like, okay, I'm going to go back to India now. And it's great because I mean, I have all this confidence and I know all these skills and I don't need to worry about. So I started, uh, but I mean, I started caring about immigration and uh, I started publishing my daily journals on the internet about my 60 day period. I didn't think much about what it's gonna get me. Uh, I mean, I just liked, I was enjoying the part of writing at the same time, all this uh, thing that was going on in my mind about the struggle and all, I was like, I wanna write it out. Either I write it out for myself or others. I mean, for me, my life is very much public. So I was like, okay, I will share whatever is there. As I started publishing that out, I started getting so many people interested in it and con people continue to read it on a regular basis. And I would be like, wow, like people understand what I am going through. And there is compassion in the world about what I'm going through. 
Can I ask you, what were some of the things you were writing about? So you got fired. You, I mean, not fired, but you were part of a layoff, unfortunately, yes. um, which, of course, as an H-1B worker, then now you have 60 days to either get a new job, switch visa status or leave the country, you know, which right. is insane. Um, you decided to. I mean, it sounds like you kind of. Well, let me ask you, did you start looking for jobs at all or were you like, you know what? I'm going to go back to India. I've had a great experience here. I've mm -hmm. learned a lot. Um, did you decide to, to do that at all or like to look for another job? So in the initial three days, I did apply. So many people reached out to me in the last like one year for a job that, hey, you are, are you looking for a PM job? I mean, I never replied back to them in the past. But what I did right. in these first three days is I looked up all my LinkedIn, all my emails. I'm like, hey, do you still have a job? And do you still have a job? And I just reached out to all of them. After three days, I stopped doing it. By the way, one thing to mention about layoff and uh, getting fired is right. look is looked at very differently in our Indian culture. Because here is how Indian ambition works. When when someone from India comes to America, it's looked at like a sign of like status. And I don't still don't understand that part, but it's looked like, okay, as if you have reached a higher stage in your life. And a lot of Indians look up to your validation of your family and everything based on if your son is in America. So there is this whole family pressure that goes in as well, where your family feels like, mm. okay, you are, their status is also like, hey, our son is in America. And here you are the one struggling and dealing with it. And uh, layoff and getting fired are looked up very, in a very degrading way in, in the Indian society. Hmm. It's like, uh, it's like as if uh, you are not worthy of anything. And uh, I mean, for me personally, I have always had very high self-belief in myself where I'm like, I can create value by just writing in my life. I can become a writer and I can make more than my salary, you know? So I just like always had the self-belief that I'm not, I'm not struggling with it, but I'm sharing the side of the story where people from India and people from other countries, how, how, how layoff and getting fired is perceived in our society is very different. How it's perceived in America, in America, it's okay. You know, it's like you get laid off or you lose your job or get fired. It's like, okay, find a new one, you know? Here, and also, India. and also the idea that if there's a layoff, it's not necessarily your fault. You know, yes. it's a large organization. You might be doing great work, but if they lose a big client and they can't mm -hmm. pay your salary anymore, they lay you off. So yeah. even even with that, like mm -hmm. getting fired, you know, quote unquote, is different maybe because you did something yeah. wrong or you made a mistake. Uh, I, I can almost understand that. I mean, it's not good to shame anybody for what happens in their career, but I can understand how someone says, oh, you got fired, you didn't do a good job, et cetera. But if you got laid off, you could have been a fantastic worker. But, you know, so and even there, you're saying that societally, you're going to get, you know, people will look negatively on you, even if you're part of a layoff. Correct. And wow. yes, exactly. And coming back to India is uh, considered as if you were not able to prove your worth mm. in America, mm -hmm. which is also a notion I don't really believe in. And mm -hmm. uh, I feel like there are so much of these perceived battles that an immigrant has to go through. And I mean, I, I'm thinking like it's probably the same in a lot of other cultures too outside India too. But there are so many perceived battles that you have to fight with this whole civilization if you end up going back and because you have to start proving yourself like, hey, yes, I am worthy and I am, I create value and I delivered so much value. And uh, that is just so bizarre to me in a lot of ways. But I feel like that is so much of struggle that a lot of people go through, even when they're thinking about going back to India or their home countries. Wow. All right. So and, and the other thing I was going to ask you was, mm -hmm. what did you write about that first day? Uh, so, I mean, here's, here's, what, so what really happened is when I got laid off, I was actually running that day. I was on my running to the, to the, to the ocean. I was on my mile th 11th where I got a like call from a manager. Hey, I want to, uh, we want to have a conversation. And I was like literally in a forest and I'm like, okay, sure. Wow. So I opened the, opened the zoom on my run and I just stopped and I'm like, Hey, how are you doing? And they oh just told God. me, they're like, Hey, you got laid off. And I'm like, okay. That's fine. You know? <laughs> I literally didn't take it personally, but within five minutes, I was like, actually, I want to re record my reaction right now. And mm. I just made a video within five minutes of my layoff where I'm like, okay, I'm on my mile 11th and I just got laid off. 
I feel bad, but I don't really feel bad. I just feel like I need few things in my life, like basic shelter, food and clothing, and everything else is anyways a luxury because I'm a very less materialistic person in a lot of ways. Uh, so I feel like that video when I made, I'm like, okay, I want to share it. But I continued running and I ended up running 15 miles that day. And uh, though there was this sadness that a life is getting taken away from me, but at the same time, I was like, well, we are all writing our own destiny and I really want to write my own journey. It will have a lot of uh, uh, uphills and it's going to have a lot of downhills and I have to accept all of it. I cannot say that I want only the good parts of it. Hmm. And uh, I did that run and then I wrote, uh, I wrote an article called as layoffs everywhere. How did I survive? And uh, <clears throat> I just like wrote about my thoughts about how, I felt like as if there was rain happening as I was walking back and I was like just experiencing this whole nature around me. <laughs> um, then next day I wrote like day one of 60, uh, the sun showed up and so did I because I went on my bike ride at like 5, 6 a.m. And I didn't change much about my day. And I just continued doing the things and I continued working eight hours the way I worked. And I continued exploring new things that I'm interested in. I continued applied to jobs and everything. So I felt like I, even in those moments where I was like, kind of like on the other side, I was like packing up my stuff and I'm like, okay, I'm moving out. I was also trying to think through about what all is left in this country that I want to do before I move my life back to India. Hmm. Um, and I will do something in India because I'm writing my journey. I'm writing my story and my story might not have just America as a part of my life. I have so much more to give to the entire world. And maybe it is, it is, it happens to be in India. It happens to be in Canada. Who knows? It could be South America, but because something is resistant, which something is stopping me, I should not be stopped because I have to keep moving in my own journey, in my own direction. So I feel like just looking at life in that way during those doors, during those days was very helpful for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, it's almost like therapeutic, right? Yeah. To to be sharing those kind of things, it's like your own self therapy. So you and I think you ran a mar uh, an Ironman a couple of days later. Yeah. So here's what happened. So I mean, given I enjoyed biking the whole last year, I was not thinking about running an Ironman race because I thought running an Ironman Ironman race is more of a validation from the external side. But I always was fit because I would bike every other day to Golden Gate Bridge and I would just like meditate there and write and read. And I was having a great time doing that thing as a like part of my health routine. But when I was like, if I'm going back to India, that moment I was like, okay, let's do everything that I mean I might ever, ever want to do that I can't do. And then I found this one Ironman race which was happening in 10 days. And I was like, actually, Let's just run this because I'm anyways trained or maybe I should take my shot at least. It was my first Iron Man, full Ironman race though. I was like, okay, let's take my shot though. You know, if I won't be able to finish, it's okay. What, what is the worst can happen? I can finish half of it and come back home. I mean, then I can try the next one. Hmm. But I think without training uh, and the, it was sold out and I was like, okay, I'm going to raise money to actually run this Ironman race now. So I raised like around $3,500 from the people for that race during my layoff. And uh, then I ran the race 10 days later. And uh, then I was like, wow, now anything is possible. <laughs> I can do, <laughs> if I can run an Ironman race in the middle of my layoff, what is the worst that can happen? That's awesome. Wow. And you raised money. You raised $3,000 in a couple of days. Yeah. I mean, some I paid and some, uh, some people yeah. I just like yeah. were like, Hey, we want to help you run this race and gave a lot of money. And luckily, in this first three days when I applied to jobs, I found a job which I'm like, this is such a culture fit where they understand me. It's an authentic fit. And these people like me and everything. And I'm like, okay, it's about 60 days now, whether they would be able to pull it off the whole visa process in 60 days or not. But it looks like there is a fit. But then I stopped applying anywhere else also because I was kind of like, okay, if either this job or I'm going back to India and I will figure out stuff after going back. So luckily that job, worked out. My manager actually read my blogs, which I wrote on my Substack, And she's like, they were so amazing to just hear your side of the story. And she actually, she's just such a courageous woman. I really ha have so much gratitude to her. And she just like fought with a lot of people that, Hey, I really want to hire this guy and want to support this guy. And 
and she got everything together and i was like wow there's so much goodness in this world mm. because i feel like my for me to ex- i w- i just want to experience life fully mm. to me everything else is unimportant if i'm not able to live what i'm here for and fighting every day and struggling every day i mean i can sit in the himalayas and just live rest of my life right <laughs> there is no point of uh, thinking too much about uh, this side of the world or that side of the world so i feel like i'm like okay whatever you know so but it, yeah. everything works out i'm just so so grateful to that yeah yeah and 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 you did you did I'm getting a job so you got the h1b back yeah. basically right and you started yes. working and so at what point did this idea for immigrant first because i think it's around this time where you started to realize like okay I am very lucky and I was able to share my story and I was able to have somebody read it but a lot of people aren't going to start blogging for example you know they 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 get let go they you know they have to leave the country they have to uproot their life that they've started here in the US etc so where did this concept of you know I want to help people in who are going through the immigration process where did that come from and sort of how did you go from that to and you know launching an ai yeah. based company so i feel like even during that time when i went through this uh, process i just realized how well i took trauma in 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 a way where i did not let this ruin my life at the same time how how devastating it can be for someone who has been living in america for 10 15 years 20 years 30 years having their kids going to school every day studying with american kids and struggling through this process and have to change their entire life in a matter of 60 days i just felt like uh, there is something wrong here mm-hmm. and it's it's not about me here it's about something bigger as a fundamental challenge with the system and uh, i saw my friends struggling through the same process and once they read read my blogs and they say how much hope my blogs bring in their life and uh, when they reach out to me and i try to help them and i'm like i'm not able to help them so much i'm only able to help them here and there at the same time i'm seeing my f- close friends going back to india and i'm like if my friends go back to india what am i going to do in america and what i am going to do with any of these green card or anything in this world because it, it then it's like a complete foreign country to me where my people can't come my family can't come then i mean these are the most important things to me my friends and my family if they cannot navigate to america then what i'm going to do in this country mm-hmm. i should better just go back to home and and serve my people that's where i got trained that's where i i i paid i got learned at iit from tax payers money in india and then i paid all the taxes here too in in american economy and i paid the medicare taxes 401k taxes and all those things too and here my, all my friends are going back and they're like and i'm feeling like this guilt where i'm like yes i am fortunate to get this job but at the same time like what i'm going to do in this country without my people where i'm like can't even share share my love can't share my passion my family has never been able to visit america because covid happened then the visa process have stopped and uh, i mean we are not that rich either i just got lucky that i met someone who paid for my education and everything but we are not that fortunate where i can like say hey come and uh, pay a million dollar to get a green card in america right. using eb5 process you know right. that's not how how we are and i mean to me the idea of america was about merit if you have talent we will solve for you but over this last one year when i saw that wait for indians is like 134 years to green card which means you will literally be kind of treated in this process for the rest of your life and i'm like no nah, i'm not i know how where my boundaries are and what i can do and what i can't do and this is something i would never accept and i'm like if this is how democracies work and uh, one of the leading democracies work then this is not the life i choose so mm-hmm. i started feeling this passion where i'm like no i'm not these are things i where my boundaries are where i would not accept it and uh, i want to show through my actions on how i would like it to be changed So that's when um, I was slowly trying to learn how to use GPT, and I was like, okay, let's see how GPT works. If I want to write my EB2 NIW petition, 
I worked on a great product uh, during my time at Castlight Health, which helped 10 million American people find COVID testing locations. And my manager got an award from the White House for that, for our work during COVID. Wow. Um, and I was working 18 hours a day for that on that product. And I was so passionate about helping American people. And I was like, this does not feel right. Here, I give all my heart and soul into serving American people. And I am struggling here for waiting for 134 years. And I'm like, okay, let's just go with a selfless act of giving and just keep giving and not expect mm. everything. But I'm like, it's not about me at this point. It's about how many people are actually going through this. Shelter comes at the base of Maslow hierarchy of needs and immigration is like shelter. Mm. For any immigrant to self-actualize, they have to first go through this journey where shelter is secure. Mm -hmm. And not having a green card is like not having freedom. It's mm -hmm. not about green card. It's not about voting rights or anything. It's about not having freedom. It's about crossing the border every time and thinking whether the guy, whether the person on the officer on the border would let you in or would not right. let you in. You know, right. whenever I cross the border, I have a lot of photos. I every time take a photo because I'm not sure if I will get in this time. And I always think about my bike in San Francisco because I'm like, that is the only materialistic thing I truly care about. <laughs> and... <laughs> I'm like, maybe I would have to sell it or I keep thinking about my friend who's going to ship it back to India if I have to, if I have to go back. But I feel like I was like, am I going to live like this for the rest 134 years of my life by getting education at one of the best institute, doing so much for American people and uh, giving everything that I have to this country and paying taxes. And I was like, this, this is not going to add up. This, this will not work out for me. That's when I was like working using AI. I was slowly developing thinking about my own petition. And I was like, okay, if I can write my petition, at least I can start helping other people who are also struggling, who can't, who might, who might not have that much money to pay for it. And uh, I was like, okay, let's start building product, keeping me in mind and keeping other people in mind and see where that product can go. So which petition were you starting to work on for yourself? So I was writing my EV2 and IW petition. Mm -hmm. And I was writing like the cover letter and I was writing like uh, the recommendation letters and getting more and more details into it. And then I was editing using GPT-4 and I was like, okay, it looks like I can improve the quality of drafts that come out of it using AI. Like it can't file or it can't uh, generate a complete petition, but at least mm -hmm. some parts of the drafting can be done using GPT. And uh, then I was using other different LLMs and uh, I was like, okay, this LLM can do this part better. This LLM can do this part better so that the overall quality of the petition goes well. You still need to have all those uh, credentials to be able to build an argument mm -hmm. about why you deserve a waiver, but at least uh, getting someone a starting point or getting someone where, okay, yes, you do have content, you do have an argument, can you can we start helping you shape that argument in a way that it is presentable and rest of the work can be done with the help of a lawyer so you have a lawyer is still filing the way they file but can you improve the quality and the work uh, quality of the draft that the lawyer gets and uh, so the lawyer can focus more on their creativity and focus more on drafting it in the right way mm. and ensuring that it matches everything and then files rather than doing the work from ground up, which is like, which kind of increases the cost to like, I think 10, 15,000, given the amount of time the lawyers have to spend on it. Of course, if they're drafting all of that from scratch, they have to learn yeah. about you, interview you, review all of your information. Um, for those listening, an LLM would be a large language model, which is effectively what a lot of these generative or, or just AI uh, tools pull from in order to understand text in order to properly analyze and create text. So you started, I'm trying to get into the head, into your head as you were doing this. Okay. GPT-4 that we can all access through openai.com. You know, um, that is general. I mean, it, it looks at the entire you know, scope of the internet. You Did you use additional tools initially? Uh, you said you, you leveraged other large language models. Did you do that through other AI tools that were already available, like a legal tool or something like that? So I think in, at the start, it was just using what GPT can provide and what uh, Claude, other Claude is like Anthropic's uh, large language model. So we were like, let's look at these two models and see how the results are coming. And then there are some open source models also. And we were like, mm -hmm. okay, let's see how the base result is coming. Now to improve the quality further is where we were like, okay, let's get some data from different law firms 
who were like, hey, we want to give you the data and uh, use our data. At the same time, I know so many immigrants who have also filed on there by themselves. So I'm like, okay, do you want to share how you drafted it? And can that be used to fine tune a large language model to mm. actually write a better quality response? Mm -hmm. um, and then I think my idea here with Immigrant First is more to bring all the people who care about immigration and who truly believe immigrants make America great together on one platform. It is the lawyers, it is the experts, it is the employers. And you know, when I talk about immigrants, people might think I do not, I'm not talking about the American people. I mean, American people and people who already, you know, should be given priority just as a base of law. I truly care about them too. So when I talk about immigrants, I'm talking about people who do want to come here, who are talented, who also improve the American economy and who also make the whole world better. Mm. American companies are saying, selling their products to the entire world right now. We are truly living in a global world. We are not living in a world where it's America and the other countries. The whole world is running together. So this whole notion about separating these things is not a good idea. Mm -hmm. When a code, when a code written in Bangalore, or anywhere in China is getting used to serve the hospital system in America. We are, we are talking about saving American lives. Mm -hmm. There is already value getting creating for American people from someone who is writing the code in Bangalore. This is this feeling of gratitude about like, Hey, I'm able to live a better life in America because of how world is contributing. And as America being a leader, it should continue supporting ability to for people to move around the world easily and be able to live their dreams because this is the whole idea of america the whole idea of america is freedom and dreams and being able to support with the highest level of judiciary and uh, the democracy and show through the actions that yes it is truly the best country to live and uh, that's whole that's the whole intention with which i am working on where it's not about separating and dividing people into like hey you belong here and you belong here we are mm -hmm. all together in this. We are all living this life together. Like mm -hmm. you understand me, I understand you. The pain you go through, I understand. I go through the same pain. So just, just like thinking that, okay, no, this is gonna save me, but it's gonna only impacting other people. That's very much injustice. Like that's, we are not understanding the whole picture where in the world we are playing together in this. Um, it's not one side or the other. Amen. Yeah. So, so tell me a little bit. Okay, when you first launched Immigrant Fur, you know, and I know it's it's a it's a young company. Um, how were you addressing what you just explained to me with Immigrant First? What was the? How did you launch it? What does it do? Uh, definitely. So I think first thing was just like I was sending these prompts mainly to people I know, where I was like, okay, you can use this to. Uh, write a better recommendation letter or just like editing it. And I was taking help from other people to help me actually write my application better. And slowly and slowly, I was like, okay, let's help people log in and sign up with their credentials and able to start building out their profile and uh, start like understanding, okay, how are they going to like build an argument around the USCIS categories like eight to 10 or whether even they have content or not. Um, if they don't have content, then my idea is like more of bringing them the resources from other people. Like so many lawyers are offering courses right now for EB1A. So I was like, okay, let's bring those courses into immigrant first where people can access the courses and actually get a better quality petition or a better quality credential for themselves. Now there are so many people who are like, Hey, I can help you generate a business plan for, I mean, there are different visas. Like, they can generate a business plan. So I was like, okay, if someone needs a business plan, how can they find that business plan company on our platform and able to do that so that they speed up their process of immigration? Then there are experts who are like, hey, I already got O1 and I know how the process works and I can at least provide you with some guidance, basic guidance, so that you can learn how to write your own O1 petition. And, uh, you know, slowly and slowly I started doing it. And then I found some lawyers who are like, hey, we, we want to help these immigrants too, just like you. And we want to come on your platform. And I was like, happy to have you. And I think 
that presentation at ALA worked out very great. I met like 20 plus lawyers who reached out and they were like, hey, we want to help you and <clears throat> support immigrants. So that actually started creating like with us having now 400 immigrants on the platform who are looking for like O1 visa, EB1A and all. And I'm just connecting them with lawyers. I'm just connecting them with the best resources because I'm like, if I'm able to help these people resolve their immigration, they can live so much better life. They can truly build so much more value for America uh, because these people are very much passionate and they want to give more and they have so much of creativity in mm -hmm. them. They're just struggling with the small thing, which in my opinion is not that important. And I'm like, let's help these people first of all, with the help of the resources, the lawyers and experts. And then, then we will figure out rest of the things. So right now, if if I want to put together, do you also support EB2 and IW as well? Correct, correct. So it's like so, you can do three things, O1, EB1A, and EB2 and IW. Got it. So if I want to put together my um, EB2 and IW petition mm -hmm. as a, as a, as the immigrant, I would log into the plat I would, you know, sign up with the platform, log in, I would create a profile for myself. Um, would you, would I then upload information about me, like a CV or awards that I've won or something like that? Uh, all this documentation to prove, you know, what I've worked on. Correct. So you first start with uploading your resume and then we will understand your base, uh, kind of like, like recommendation to you about like, okay, this is how you can pull information in different categories for USCIS. Then we ask you to like provide you with more award, provide us with more awards and membership. And you can share like, okay, yes, I have membership in these, I have awards in these, and you can upload all the documents. And then we can provide, we provide you with a, with a kind of like a set of questions where you can answer and it will generate a great recommendation letter for you. And on the platform, there are lawyers. So you can like reach out to these lawyers personally, and you can be like, Hey, I want to work with you. And uh, when people work with uh, them, then I mean, they just, the lawyers are able to help them and charge whatever they want to charge at this point. And, uh, we don't, we don't make any money out of this. We just want to help immigrants right now. Uh, and uh, my goal is to just have these people understand themselves better. If they need anything else, then they can come back to the platform and get either the courses to improve it, either the experts to improve it, either the lawyers to improve it so that they can get their, they get, they, get, they can get their NIW EB1A faster. Got it. So right now it's like an expert guide that looks at a person's profile it looks at their cv and it says mm -hmm. okay it's it looks like you want to apply for an o1 let's say mm -hmm. um you you have a phd in something do you and then it, it maybe tells them do you have any awards did you publish any papers and sort of walks them through it and then it has options that say here's some external resources you can use to get learn more about the o1 process uh, or here are some lawyers we can immigration lawyers that are on our platform that we can connect you with that can help you through the case um, are they so so then let me ask you the other question if i'm an immigration attorney especially for you know for this show and people who listen um if i'm an immigration attorney Mm -hmm. How would I be on the platform to help these folks? Is it, do I have my own profile and I could interact with the person or mm -hmm. do I just, is it like a marketplace where I matched with them and then I go off of immigrant first and work with the uh, client sort of directly or how does that work? So slowly what we are building is like more of a case AI powered case management for lawyers. Hmm. So the way it works is uh, the lawyer can sign up right now. They can go to our platform and say, get started. And when they get started, uh, it will ask them, I'm a, I'm a lawyer and I want to help immigrants. If they sign up as a lawyer, then their profile is going to be published to immigrants. And uh, immigrants would be able to book 30 minutes of time with them, like a consultation on their calendar, on their Google calendar. They can integrate the Google calendar on the platform. And then lawyer would be able to help them. And once lawyer is like, yes, I feel like I want to help you more. They can figure out the payment and everything themselves. We have not integrated any payments. We just want to make sure this model is working and helping a ton of uh, immigrants. And I feel like I'm already seeing so many people are booking meetings through our platform right now uh, with different experts. And because they are like telling me about the bugs that are there where they were like, okay, I want to make sure the time is showing in the right time zone. Mm. So I was like, okay, which means people are coming to the platform um, in to help to look for these resources. And down the line, we will continue building more and more and uh, continue to help 
more immigrants and lawyers make it easy for the lawyers to be able to file for them because lawyers are charging the the charge for this application is because of the amount of effort lawyers actually have to put in in writing a great petition and we can reduce that part of the effort which will bring the cost down for immigrants so it brings the cost down for immigrants it also supports the lawyer because they have to do less work Correct. they can help more people more quickly exactly so because o1 is like uncapped visa um the challenge is uh, being able to prove someone of that level and when i pro when we provide all the resources and also immigrants build their own profile then immigrant lawyers can get a lot more immigrants to help because then we can help more immigrants we can process more o1 visas for people um so yeah it's it's the people who are on the, the lawyers who are on the our platform they are saying they are seeing real value for eb1a using the platform with ai services they are able to edit better they are able to write better content so yeah that's how we are thinking of it so from the ai perspective because i know a lot of people always have questions about that specifically how does ai actually play a role with with an immigrant first is it when somebody uploads documentations mm -hmm. you know it feeds into like a chat gpt powered uh engine that um then gives them tailored recommendations or are you drafting fully drafting you know initial drafts of, of cover letters like where does the generative ai come in and how does it how does it come in yeah definitely so i think down the line we're going to continue improving the quality Perfect. of how how well it's going to be right now yes it generates a basic cover letter it it generates a basic index and also goes into details of explaining all these different categories of uscis it can pull information from the internet too to kind of validate some of the arguments such as like adding arguments from the white house related to xyz field so it can say that okay this person is exceptional or require a national interest waiver because white house has talked about this in the past so all those things can be there in can is going to be there in the platform to provide more and more value to the lawyer but i think given law, lawyer is like the one who's using our platform uh, we want to make sure they they are getting the right things that they need to write it so down the line we will continue enhancing the feature but i think a lot of features are already available that's awesome yeah of course i mean so yeah. uh, um so let me ask you this what do you need right now you know i i know uh you know, we met at the AILA American Immigration Lawyers Association Technology Summit. You gave a presentation. It was really awesome. You know, um, and there was a question there that said, how can how can the immigration industry, lawyers, maybe in-house professionals, et cetera, maybe experts that have gone through this, how can they help you? What are you looking for now as like a pretty early stage startup? definitely i think uh, so i need so now we got a lot of immigrants on the platform and mm -hmm. i am feeling like we don't have enough lawyers to be able to support them mm -hmm. so i am looking for more and more lawyers to sign up with our platform and just see how much value it is generating for them and how much value it is getting created so i need more lawyers to sign up through our platform that is one thing the other i got connected to a lot of people actually in immigration over this last month um some of them are like hey you can also help us on eb5 visa where you can also do the paperwork for that mm -hmm. some are like uh hey there are other visas which are um where people who are struggling with daca can you help these people move to employment categories with the help of your processes and able to help them get green card so i'm thinking of all these different insights and how to approach all of the other visas too but once uh, I will get be able to get more and more attorneys to sign up and give us feedback, we would be able to build the best product. So the way industry can help me is having more lawyers, immigration lawyers, using our product, helping immigrants through the platform, telling me how the platform can be improved further and, and be able to help immigrants where they are like, yes, this is very useful. And if it's not, just like tell me on my face that, okay, it's not helping us. But I feel like we have to help. So many immigrants are already there and would appreciate all the attorneys and uh, immigration lawyers to help us and join on this on this journey and help immigrants. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. And I think uh, the, what I love about the immigration industry is that um, uh, most people in it really do want to help. 
Uh, and and it's it, a lot of people are selfless. A lot of people, you know, they're not in it for the money necessarily. If they can make a good life, that's really great. But the idea is not, oh, I can't wait to become a millionaire as an immigration lawyer. It's 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 not that. It's I can't wait to help a million people. Yeah. You know, like so. So I, I I think I really do believe that you'll get there. And, you know, we'll continue to grow. And obviously, as more individuals sign up and as more lawyers sign up um, and you've have you raised any, uh, you know, have you received any investment for this yet? If you can share uh, or bootstrap no. for now, B- bootstrap for now, I feel like uh, I'm lucky. So my, my younger brother came on a visit. He's a software developer. And uh, we were like, I was asking him, bro, you want you want to help me on this thing that I want to build. And some, him and his friends were like, hey, we want to help build this together. So yeah, we have not raised uh, any capital. We just want to help immigrants and we will see where it goes down the line. But I think uh, it is very important where I'm like, I'm able to contribute to something that impacted me and I do not want to see other people suffer through it. And uh, once I'm like, okay, I'm able to help these people, then down the line, uh, it's definitely going to help a lot more people. Yeah, and then of course, if you end up raising money at any point having that initial traction having the initial uh, uh users and, and and attorneys on the platform will be really helpful yeah um i want to do a quick pause here uh yes. we've got a couple comments here so we have juan jose says atala garwal so great to see you on roman zelchenko's podcast thank you thank you juan it's great to see you and also great to have met you uh as well in person yes. at the ala tech conference so thank you for the comment um we have shweta singh saying is there any job opportunities? So, you know, I, I don't know where you are at all, but maybe you have some opportunities to help. I don't know if it's a, a full-time job yet, because I know early days, it's hard to, you know, hire yeah. people full-time, but are, are there ways that people can, can help you somehow maybe? Yeah, I feel like uh, right now I'm, given there are so many constraints in time and making able to focus on the right things uh, and keeping things running and like keeping this, all this passion and energy running, I feel like we are, we are very lean, but down the line, uh, you know, as we see things helping and uh, helping people, then, you know, it's more of a shared business, I guess. I say uh, everyone is a part of this journey with me because I'm not building it for immigrants. I'm building it for immigrants, lawyers, and we will take it how far we can take and how many people we can help um, not struggle through mobility on earth, being able to navigate easily di- between different countries. So we will see how the vision kind of keeps going forward and how many people uh, we can we can take in to help together. So, yeah, uh, um, I, I love that. Uh, I think as we close, I, I, mm-hmm. I wanted to ask, you know, sometimes when I have folks who've had a long career and built a company over many, many years, I like to ask them what's a piece of advice that they would give themselves now like what's the most recent piece of advice that they've received? Um, I think you're still at the early stages. So I, that's really exciting because there's so much you can still do. But I'm curious, even where you are now, what's the most recent piece of advice that you've received that's really sort of um, driving you or, or or that's helping you move in a particular direction? Um, I feel like having a strong why is the most important thing that everyone should have in their building. And I feel like, maybe that was not there in my previous ideas that I did and which is very, very true in this, what I'm building on because I am truly driven. I'm not true. I'm not driven on this idea about how much money I'm going to make. Yes. Immigration is then I, I might be pursuing other ideas if it was all about the money, but I feel like this is just provides me with such a strong force of why, where I'm like, this provides me with able to help people, and feel good about what I'm contributing to. And uh, whenever I wake up thinking about this and able to help like more immigrants, I'm like, yes, I am fulfilling my purpose. I am able to take action, show through my actions that how much I truly care about this cause. And I feel like having that strong why is the most important thing because you will face a lot of hardship uh, in this journey as as a founder or anything you are building. But just when you have a strong why and you know and you repeat that why in your mind that how important it is what your it is this why is and important not just for you as an individual but just how important it is for the whole society and the world then you are always driven by something internal and not just external and i think that is the 
thing which is very important from me from my perspective amen i agree yeah. with you 100 percent. thank you um atal this has been really awesome I, i've loved this conversation i'm i'm inspired by your passion uh and obviously and i think many many people are too so i i wish you the best i mean i know you're moving forward so i hope you continue to drive this thing forward and you know continue to grow the impact that you have on the industry and on so many people's lives um so thank you for coming on the show and you know sharing your journey sharing your story and um for those of you who are interested in checking out the company the website is immigrantfirst.ai so okay. For those watching or listening, check it out. I'll have also a link to your LinkedIn profile and the company in the show notes. Um, so, thank you so much for being here. This has been great, and I thank you for it. thank you for this opportunity. I really appreciate it, and I look forward to connecting with everyone on how we can improve policy of immigration in this country and how we can truly make America a great place to live for immigrants, Americans, and for everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. What a, and just as we were saying that Juan Jose says, continue to make an impact at all. So totally agree. Um, thank you, Juan, for, for, for watching. Really appreciate it. Thank you everybody so much, everybody else for being here, if you're tuning in live, um, for your, for your comments, for watching, for, uh, you know, if you are, are celebrating, I hope you had a th happy Thanksgiving. Um, I'm very, I love, I love, you know, talking to folks who are just starting out too, because I think that passion is contagious and it's really there in the early days of starting a company for sure. You know, I can give you, I can share that from personal experience as well. So I hope you all have found this interesting and inspiring. And I hope you take some of that positive energy with you into the work that you're doing into the weekend or whenever you're watching this. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Um, thank you, Shweta. Bless you as well. Thank you. Uh, and I hope you all stay safe, have a great weekend, and see you next week. For We have one or two more episodes for calendar year 2023. I'm excited to be back with the show again. So see you all next week. Have a great weekend. Stay safe and peace out.